Welcome to Brandstorm, the podcast that talks to the people behind America's brands. I'm Dan Trzinski, president of Platypus Advertising and Design. And I'm Nancy Christopher, PR director at Platypus. Successful new products typically fulfill a need in the marketplace, but that's just part of what makes today's conversation compelling. Jason McDevitt is the CEO of Green Ops Ammo. He is joined by Kirk Havens, a co-founder of Green Ops and director of the Coastal Watersheds Program at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Green Ops Ammo is a Virginia company company that makes biodegradable shotgun wads. Their new product may be a solution that ironically puts environmentalists and hunters in the same camp. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Oh, you're very welcome. Let's start by talking about what exactly a shotgun wad is and what happens after a gun is fired. So shotgun wads are one of the components of a shotgun shell. Historically, the main job of the wad was simply to separate the shot from the powder. So all wads actually used to be biodegradable. They were made from materials like felt and cork and cardboard, and they were generally disc-shaped. And then plastic wads came along. Plastic wads had enhanced functionality. So in particular, the plastic wads include a column or a cup that surrounds the shot, and this protects the barrel of the gun from the shot. So that's really not necessary when you're using lead shot, which is soft, but lead shot is banned for waterfowl hunting pretty much across the globe and increasingly for other uses. So instead, you use steel or tungsten alloys, and they're harder, and so you need to protect the barrel or else it gets scratched. So that's one thing. Plastic wads also expand a little bit when they're fired, and that forms an excellent gas seal in the barrel, and that prevents gas flow by and ensures that the energy of the powder blast is converted into shot flow. Velocity. The plastic wads also can improve patterning. So, so basically, they do a lot. They have excellent performance. And to date, nothing else matches their performance. When you sh- shoot a shotgun, the wad actually flies out with the shot. Uh, it typically goes downfield 20 to 50 yards. And unfortunately, a lot of times you're shooting over water or into dense brush. And so it's often impossible or impractical to find or retrieve it. Yeah, to pick it up. I'm a hunter, so I've experienced that. And when you're walking around in the woods, one of my pet peeves is always you see just the actual shotgun shell, so the plastic and the brass, you know, laying on the ground, and you're always picking those up. And it's like, God, can't people just pick that up? But the shotgun wad, that piece of plastic, kind of looks like a badminton birdie coming out of there. It's too far away, and it's almost impossible to find that. Are there other problems with the shotgun wads? Yeah, this is Kirk. I can talk a little bit about that. It's just another form form of uh, plastic pollution that that's out there in the environment when it gets into the marine environment you know it becomes a another set of problems associated with it because plastic and water tends to pick up organic pollutants and adhere to them so you have an issue there as well as it being recognized as a you know possible food source to uh, animals in the marine environment they found plastic wads in uh, bird foraging bird stomachs and and things of that sort but another issue becomes is that as they can physically break down. They don't necessarily biodegrade, but they break apart over time into smaller and smaller pieces. And and that brings us into the problem of microplastics, which um, a lot of people have heard about recently. So the smaller you are, the more things can consume you. And that's the same problem with floating around in the water and picking up organic pollutants and then becoming consumed by some organism. So there's a problem in, you know, in the terrestrial environment and, uh, and then there's a problem in the marine environment. So, I mean, it is fair to say that environmentalists and hunters, for that matter, really have a right to be concerned about these plastic shotgun wads. Oh, definitely. And we were approached by uh, hunters and sportsmen who recognize that this is a growing issue. You know, there are billions of shotgun shells produced annually, and, and they recognize that. And, and I think most hunters and sportsmen are, are conservationists at heart, and they, they don't want to be polluting the uh, environment. And, they, and in many cases, they're leasing land from other people who don't particularly want plastic pollution on their properties as well. We were also contacted interestingly enough, by cranberry bog farmers who, you know, have, have oh, their yeah. bog. Yeah, and, and if people hunting for waterfowl uh, nearby and it washes into their, their cranberry bog uh, area and can contaminate their crop. We are also contacted by ranchers concerned about uh, their cattle grazing and picking up plastic wads and consuming them and possibly contributing to something called hardware disease. So there's a, there's a lot of different constituents interested in this and they seem to be coming together recognizing that it's a problem that they can all work on and trying to find a solution. So how does Green Ops Ammo 
Uh, how are you guys addressing this? So, so our product pretty much moderates or eliminates all of these issues. So, so one interesting feature of our wads is that they break apart after leaving the barrel. So they stay intact inside the barrel to protect the barrel and provide the gas seal I mentioned earlier. But then they break apart into little pieces, you know, within a meter of leaving the barrel. And that's important for several reasons. So, so we get cleaner release of the shot, which is great for p- performance. But the breaking apart is also important in addressing the environmental issues that Kirk talked about. So because our wads fragment, they're hard to find. So there's less visual pollution that mars the environment. If ingested by animals, they're less likely to be problematic, um, you know, less likely, for example, to cause hardware diseases. And most importantly, our ammo uses biodegradable shotgun wads. So the wads don't persist for decades or centuries in the environment. Instead, our wads break down to small organic compounds that are then reassimilated, taken back up into nature's carbon cycle. And so by breaking apart into small pieces also, this biodegradation process is sped up because biodegradation is surface area dependent. Well, I was thinking in the water too, I heard that they actually sink they don't float or wash up on the beach. That's correct. So our, our wads sink, and that's that's an important feature. So rather than most plastic does tend to float, and so it can be picked up by, for example, seagoing birds. And um, you know, ours does sink. It sinks in place, and it degrades. So, so there are a lot of products that use kind of quote-unquote biodegradable plastics. And I'm not talking about shotgun wads here, but just products in general. And yeah, they degrade in an industrial compost heap but they might not break down so well out in your backyard or, or in the lake or an ocean. But our wads do genuinely break down on land and in water. As a hunter, cost is an important part as well as the performance. Are, are these things going to cost more if I switch to this type of this type of wad? They'll cost a little more. You know, I, so I'd agree first that, that performance is the most important thing Absolutely. Here. You don't right. want to, you don't want to cripple an animal if you're a hunter, if you're a good hunter, you, you want it to do the job and do what it's supposed to do. Performance definitely and protecting the guns important, but at what price? Right. And so, you know, as for the cost, we're operating at a, a small, you know, inherent disadvantage simply based on the cost of our raw materials, which are a little bit more. Of course, we're not using very much. So it's maybe a couple cents per shell in terms of raw material cost. Oh, that's not and bad. maybe it dates out to a nickel per shell at retail. So it's not too much, particularly given the kind of wide range of pricing for waterfowl loads, which range from maybe 50 cents per shell up to a couple dollars. So we're going to price our products competitively and we'll compete on that basis. Our, our biggest cost issue right now is not so much the raw materials, but simply economies of scale. So even if our wads and raw materials cost the same as big competitors like Winchester or Rio, it still costs us much more to make our ammo. Uh, and that's going to be the case until we can produce in large volumes. What do you feel is most important to the environmentalists? And do you think that your product is going to bring these groups together? And this is this is Kirk and I can answer that one. I, I think that in this particular case, there's not really a distinction. I think everybody that we've contacted bone from the sportsman and the hunter and, and what might be considered environmentalists is, is that they are all interested in trying to have st- try to remove or prevent or at least minimize plastic uh, getting into the environment. And so this is, has already brought them together. It's been really a fascinating journey you know, dealing with all the different community types and, and groups who have uh, come to us and, and es- expressed basically the same concern. You know, we don't want plastic pollution in the environment. And uh, how do we work together to deal with that? Most owners that we talk with, you know, really are, are pretty passionate about this issue. They do consider themselves conservationists. They hate the idea that they're leaving their wild behind and they'd like to do something about it. It's just there's not products out there that, that genuinely work well that they can you can they can use. I would suspect that education is going to be huge in getting this product out into the market and acceptable to everyone. I mean, it sounds like it solves the problem, but you're going to have to educate people and let them know that this really is the alternative for it. Yeah, it was. I mean, the first I heard of this when we invited you guys on, I was fascinated by the by the subject and and also talking to somebody that's this is a product that's still in development. So how long will it be before or you are making enough to where we will see this in stores or can actually buy this product? Right. So our production run this year is going to be very small. And unfortunately, our availability in stores will be limited. Uh, next year, though, 2019, uh, we're hoping everybody should be able to get our ammo quite easily. Uh, you know, ultimately, it depends on demand and and awareness. And and as Nancy suggested, that's, that's our next challenge. Uh, to date, our main focus has been developing the technology and squaring away the manufacturing. And let me also add that, you know, we're hoping to do a deal with a strategic partner that would manufacture and sell the product outside the United States. So the regulations around ammunition 
competition are so daunting that it doesn't make sense for a startup company like us to try to export our product. It's just too difficult. So we're going to partner outside the United States. And ironically, it could be that our technology, therefore, is more readily available outside the U.S. Uh, than inside, at least for the first couple of years, because some of these potential partners are you know, big companies with automated production and distribution and money and marketing muscle and all the things that you know we don't have, but, but someday we hope to have. Do you think major ammo manufacturers are going to embrace this whole idea of biodegradable shotgun wads? It's a really interesting question. Pretty much everyone in the industry is trying or has tried to make a biodegradable wad that performs as well as their conventional plastic wads. And no one has succeeded yet, at least not with a product that's that's commercially available. And it's not for lack of trying, it's because it's very difficult. Uh, and that's why we're so excited about our product. The reason everyone's trying to do this is the possibility of legislation or regulation. Single-use disposable plastics are really in the crosshairs of legislators around, no, no pun intended, of, of legislators <laughs> around. That prospect is out there. And you know I think every company is understandably looking at alternatives to their current product products. But a slightly different take on that question is, is whether the manufacturers would embrace this movement, even if not compelled to do so by government policies. And that would actually answer, be better, I would imagine. That's right. And I, you know, the answer to that is yes, at least for some companies, definitely not all of them. But you know, I was talking with one large manufacturer uh, who said that irrespective of any policies out there that incentivize the use of biodegradable wads, they're going to develop them anyway, just because it's the right thing to do. And that's the way that their employees felt. And that's the way that their management felt. So, so that was really gratifying to hear. So the million or maybe billion dollar question is, you do have a patent on this, correct? <laughs> yes. Uh, we have an issue patent, uh, many pending patents uh, on all aspects of the technology, both inside the U.S. and outside. So as I said, we, we are looking for partners. And in order for them to determine whether or not they want to partner with us, they need to, to test our ammo, know everything about it, know how to make it, which makes it very easy for them to replicate it. And so, you know, without patent protection, we'd be toast. Sure. So what are your current plans to bring this product to market? Yeah, we definitely would not be a, a good case study for business schools. Pretty much had a, a field of dreams approach to marketing so far. You know, if you build it, they will come. You know, that's not ideal. And, you know, it's, it's, that's not by design. It's more by necessity. You know, we haven't had the resources, either the time or money to do much else. So in truth, for a long time, we struggled to develop a genuinely good technology or manufacture it at a reasonable cost. So we put all our focus there. You know, we're a technology-driven company. We now feel that we've got the technology in place. We've finally gotten the technical hurdles behind us. And so now it's time to move to the other pieces and kind of move beyond our, our preliminary approach. So, so our, our goal is really to become the Tesla of shotgun ammunition. Uh, we want a premium product that's better for the planet. And getting there and getting the branding and marketing right is going to be a big challenge. So have you found any barriers? Have you talked to the major retail you know, distributors, the Cabela's of the world and those type of stuff? Are they recognizing that this is coming and and they holding shelf space for you? You know, the answer to that is we really uh, haven't approached national retailers, the major ones like Walmart or Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's yet. Um, so honestly, I, I can't say for sure that I know those barriers. We viewed it as a little premature to do that until we worked out everything with production. And we're just about there now. So it probably doesn't make sense for us to get into Walmart this year, but you know, we'd love to be in uh, Walmarts and, and, and Bass Pro Shops across the country next year. Uh, as, as for the independent stores and smaller chains, which do a lot of the uh, ammunition business, you know, we have reached out to some of them and I'm anticipating the biggest barriers are going to again, be based on a lack of awareness of the product and demand for it. So we want to get into, for example, the Sports Inc. show in a couple of months. And that's where many independent stores go and place orders for products for the year. Uh, we'd also like to work with distributors like Sports South. In either case, demand is a big factor. And so we need retailers to tell distributors you know, that they, they want to stock our product. And it doesn't take an Einstein to realize that you know, that's, that's difficult when nobody has heard of you. So we, we do have to cross that barrier. I think, too, if you get someone within the um, hunting industry, you know, who's pretty well known to help you expound on the benefits of biodegradable shotgun wads, that that's going to be helpful as well. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we're, we're very excited to work with hunt clubs and hunting glides, uh, outfitters, and, you know, we're hopeful that some of them can be brand ambassadors for us. 
So the Shark Tank question, are you still looking for investors to try to make this happen for you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, always. Um, you know, we've been fortunate to have non-dilutive grant funding that has gotten us a long way. Uh, we're going to conclude a round of funding in the very near future, and then we're going to raise additional capital later in the year to fund our operations for 2019. So the amount of that second capital raise is going to depend on you know any agreements we put in place with potential strategic partners. So I'm not sure how much we're going to raise. We'll have a better handle on that in a few months, but we're, we're definitely looking looking for investors. We're always looking for people who believe in what we're trying to do and who like our product, whether it's investors or employees or customers. And really, that, that's one of the reasons we're so gratified that we got a great response from our beta testers. Uh, many of them wanted to have some role in the company going forward. So that was that was really nice to hear. You know, before we end this conversation today, I did want to know a little bit about you all yourselves. How long have you been working on this? There's a big dedication here. I heard you're scientists and have a lot invested in this personally yourself as well. Yeah, I'll let Kirk take that one first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Uh, well, it's a really interesting story, and, and it would have taken an entirely new podcast to talk about. But, uh, <laughs> but I'll give you the quick summary. We've been working in this field of trying to deal with um, marine pollution, particularly plastic or derelict fishing gear and all the aspects of that for probably about a decade or so. And uh, I've been working with the bioplastics as a possible solution to a lot of the problems out there. And so um, it just happened that in some of the things that we'd worked on, and particularly in beach cleanups, one of the big things that was showing up was you know, plastic shotgun wads. And so we shifted gears a little to try to look at developing a solution for, for that particular form of plastic pollution. So probably over a decade or so in the working on specific solutions to issues associated with marine debris and plastic pollution. And that's a long time. Uh, it's very gratifying work. You're actually producing a, a solution that people are looking for. Yeah, and I, I just don't see the downside to this at all from any particular side. So I, I think you're really on to something here. Right. You know, when you find out that, hey, the cost isn't that much and it performs as well as the plastic and it's available to you everywhere, I think this is going to be a win-win. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Thanks. That's what we have heard so far from pretty much anybody that we've talked to, that it's, you know, the typical no-brainer, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very exciting. Well, best of luck to you all. You're looking for investors and I'm sure people might have questions about what you do there at Green Ops. If someone wants to contact you, What's the best way to do that? Uh, probably the best way is to go on the internet and search for us, Green Ops Ammo, www.greenopsammo.com. You can contact us through that. You can contact us through Instagram, or you can just look us up. We're pretty easy to find, and we, we do try and get back to people very quickly. Okay, so thank you, Kirk and Jason. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, and, and we wish you a very successful future. Yeah, good luck to both of you. Thank you. All right, well, this is Dan Trzinski, along with Nancy Christopher at Platypus Advertising and Design, an awesome company company that creates perceptions that influence choice for a variety of regional, national, and even global brands on a daily basis. We hope you'll join us next week for another episode of Brandstorm. Brandstorm.